we were talking about pre-stressing stages, and I was saying that one of the important things in pre-stress design is the stages of the pre-stressing. Okay, let me remind you what we were talking about because it's been a long time. We were talking about the pre-stressing, and we were saying pre-stressing is a way to to get benefits from concrete in many ways. Number one, we reduce the tension because concrete is weak in tension, and we also uh, in, you know, induce some upward forces which balance the load. So we have two effects, load balancing, and we also have the effect of the reduced tension, and we also have the third effect of the high strength materials, high strength you know, uh, tendons, high strength concrete. So all in all, this is a very good thing. And we also said that the only problem is that we need special equipment, special skills to design and, and, and make the pre-stress concrete. And that is the reason that it is not commonly used. But now it is becoming more and more common. In fact, on in tall building design in Bangkok, especially in Thailand, almost every tall building that you see has a post-tension slab. Because it is so much easier, so much better, is, you know, you have thin slabs, reflection is reduced, and it is much better system than conventional slab. So almost every tall building is using post-tension slab in their system. All the bridges, every bridge, concrete bridge is post-tension. So the application of post-tensioning is really, really huge. All of these bridges that you see, sky train and, and whatever you see, it's all post-tension concrete. And one of the th things about the pre-stressing problem is the stages. Because pre-stressing is not done as one operation. It is carried out in stages. And why do we do it in stages? For several reasons. Number one, the, the process of the construction. Because for concrete, for pre-stressing to be applied, we need to first of all cast the concrete, especially post-tension. Pre-tensioning, we normally don't do anymore. Hardly any pre-tensioning is done except for pre-cast members. On site, we cannot do pre-tensioning. So pre-tensioning -pre is only done for pre-cast members in the factory, right? The, the, the small things. But in major, major structures, we don't do that. It is almost always post-tensioning. And because we almost do post-tensioning, that means we have to do it in, we have to wait for certain things. For example, number one, we cast concrete, then we wait until it has become strong enough, concrete is hardened, has gained this the, the strength, then we apply compressive force, otherwise it will break. So stage number one is that you cast concrete and wait for it to harden. Stage number two is that you start to, you start the post-tensioning process. During that process, there are three, four, five stages happening, right? For example, now you have the concrete and then you put the tendon through it. Last time I told you there's a tendon, there, there's a hole, through that you cross the tendon. And then on one end, you put a jack. And on one end, you put the anchor. So the, the, the tendon goes here, it is anchored here. And then after that, it goes through the, the duct and it's on the side, you put a big jack. And then with the jack, you pull the tendon out. So when you pull the tendon from the jack, the jack is transferring force to the concrete at that time as a, as a support for the jack. So jack is supported on concrete, it pulls the tendon and the reaction is actually on concrete. Now the problem is that after you pull the tendon enough, now you want to release, you want to remove the jack, right? So before you remove the jack, you need to lock the tendon so that it won't flip back to its original position. You just, just like you want to, you, you know, rubber band, you pull it and you want to tie it somewhere. But before you, when you tie it, you know the balloons, when you try to blow it, a balloon and you try to put the clothes, and you have to do it quickly before the air goes out. But no matter what you do, some air will always leak before you tie it up. It's just the same thing. You are filling a balloon and then you need to tie it quickly so the air doesn't go out, so the balloon is inflated. But even in that process of tying the knot, some air will leak. Exactly the same way when you have pulled the tendon and you want to lock it and release the jack, during that time some slip will occur. Because the tendon, when you, when you lock it, it will slip a little bit before it is anchored. So that is called the anchorage loss. So the first thing that happens is that as soon as First, first loss happens, or first, first stage is when you pull it, there's a friction between the cable and the duct. So there will be some friction. 
and then then you when you pull it when you pull it at that time the jacking force is higher than the pre-stressing force because you have to pull and then release and when you release some force is lost so in fact the highest force on concrete is acting during the jacking process right so that is stage number one that means during the jacking before anchorage you apply the highest pre-stress compression onto the concrete member so that's first stage so you see that before pre-stressing during pre-stressing and at transfer so before pre-stressing concrete is there and at that time dead load if the dead load is acting the structure may crack because of the dead load if you are not supporting it there is no pre-tensioning pre pre-stress so the structure may fail at that point that means before pre-stressing structure must be supported you cannot let go of the forms before pre-stress has been applied so that is before pre-stressing during pre-stressing as I mentioned to you you have this whole process going on jacks are being placed and you are pulling it and during that time high force will be transferred to the concrete then at transfer at transfer means when you release the jack and put the, put the locking device that process in a split second or in the force is transferred from the jack to the locking device and then some pre-stress is lost so you have some loss and some, some things to be considered so stress must be checked before pre-stressing to make sure that whatever the structure state is it is not damaged right and if you are transporting the member somewhere it should not be damaged if it is precast so we have to make sure that before pre-stressing the member design is acceptable there are no overstressing and so on number two during pre-stressing we have to make sure that the jacking force will not damage the member normally if the member has to be damaged it will damage during during the pre-stress operation because that is where the maximum force will be applied so during pre-stressing we have to check the stresses then we have to check the stresses at transfer once you transfer then upward forces will come and the structure will go up and during that time tension may come on the upper if you force tension too much it might crack in the other direction upside right because pre-stressing will lift it up and if you over, over pre-stress it it might crack because of the upward moment that will be induced then intermediate stage during transport also you need to check make sure that there is no problem transport and handling and loading and unloading and final stages after the pre-stressing has been done sustained load that means load which will not go away it will always be there long term loads working loads cracking loads and ultimate loads so working load is that means the light loads that will normally be there but at the actual light, light load working condition cracking load is very important we must know what is the load at which this pre-stress member will crack because typically it is not supposed to crack some tension may be allowed but if you go beyond that it will crack and we don't want cracking in pre-stress because unlike normal reinforcement if it, it is supposed to be cracked right and that is how the reinforcement is calculated based on crack tax action pre-stress it is not supposed to be cracked so we must make sure that the loading will not crack the section so there is a totally opposite design consideration reinforced concrete supposed to crack that is why strut and tie model work that is why everything works pre-stress member not supposed to crack right so we need to know the cracking load and make sure that the actual load will not go beyond that then ultimate load what if the load actually exceeds pre-stressing and cracking does come will the member fall down or it will simply crack because after cracking it will become a normal reinforced concrete beam it will no longer be pre-stressed then 
the ultimate strength should be checked the same way as normal pre-stress concrete is checked and then that, that tendon that you put will become a normal reinforcement. The effect of the pre-stress and all is gone. As soon as the cracking occurs, no more pre-stressing effect because now whatever moment is left to do the cracking, the pre-stressing effects and everything is already been balanced. So the remaining moment is now a normal moment on a beam which is a reinforced beam either having conventional reinforcement and also having pre-stress. A pre-stress start to act like a reinforcement, just like a ball, right? And here the problem, main issue is here then, bonded and unbonded. We talked about whether the pre-stress is bonded or unbonded last time. Bonded means that you put the pre-stress in after you anchor it, jack it, you inject grout into the opening, into the duct. You have many holes and then you inject grout and then that grout hardens. And that means after pre-stressing is done, the, the, the strand is fully bonded to the section, just like normal reinforcement. So in that case, it, it can be used to calculate the ultimate strength of the member, just like a reinforcement, right? But if it is unbonded, it cannot be used as a reinforcement. So if unbonded post-tensioning is used, it can only be used for service level and cracking. After that, it has no, no use and that is very dangerous. That's why some people do not like unbonded pre-stressing because it has no value after the cracking load has been achieved. So for overloading, unbonded reinforcement is not good. Un unbonded pre-stressing is not good. And for that's why most structures are bonded, except some which are not unbonded and there are reasons why they are not unbonded. These are some of the limits in the code for checking the stresses at different stages of the pre-stressing that I talked about. At different stages, the code allows you different values of the stress. For example, at, when you are jacking it, it allows you very high strength because it is going to be there for a short time. So the allowable stress is high at the jacking and at the transfer, or it is not so high for sustain, so, and so forth. So these limits are different, right? 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.45, 0 0.5, something like that. Okay. Please check these limits. I don't want to, but the main concept behind is that for each level of the construct of the pre-stressing stage, the allowable stresses are different for compression and tension, and also the strain. For example, the strain. During pre stressing, due to tension, tendon jacking force, it is going to be 0 0.8 FPU or 0.94 FPY. That is the ultimate strength, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 FPU ultimate. So, up to 80% of the ultimate strength of the tendon you can use during jacking, or 94% of the proof stress. You remember what's the proof stress, right? Yeah. So, similarly, for pre stress tendons, rigid after transfer, 0.7. That means that much allowance is made for lossing, losses, right? About 10% loss is allowed. And then, immediately, concrete stress, not more than the following values compression, 0.5 before losses, extreme fiber stress, compression, 0.6. FC prime, up to 60% of FC prime is allowed in the compression, right? Tension, 0.25, uh, square, uh, you know, square root FC, except at the end of the simply score, something like that, where they allow 0.5. So, the point is that these limits have been set by the courts, and the whole game, it's a game, of pre-stress design is to check the stress at every location in the structure, at every stage of the pre-stressing and make sure that they don't exceed these limits. That's it. That is all is the duty of the pre-stress designer to check the stresses at every location in the structure, at every stage of pre-stressing to make sure that none of the value exceeds these allowable stresses. That is it. It's really that, that much. Plus minus plus 
this load plus that load minus that load, this stage, what is the final stress? Is it okay or not? That's it. There are seven, eight main conditions that you need to check and, uh, and, and, uh, and verify and that is the whole process. So at some stage, we, all, all, we already talked about that we treat the pre-stress member as a homogeneous material. So it's a very, very good thing. All of the problems of reinforced concrete disappear. There is no difference. You can use the combined stress equation, which you can use for steel. You can also use for concrete. So literally speaking, there is no difference between the, the stress checks for a steel section and a pre-stress section at service level. They are the same. Same equations apply. So, or any material for that matter. So it's a homogeneous material and that makes the whole process very, very simple and very easy in terms of the service level. So we just calculate the moments and stresses that using the service level conditions and homogeneous equation. Ultimate stage is just like a reinforced concrete. It becomes a reinforced concrete because at that time the cracking is allowed and the pre-stress effects have already been gone. So ultimate stress it becomes a reinforced concrete. So it's interesting. This is a transforming material. At one time it is like steel or any other homogeneous material and at some time it is like a reinforced concrete material. Right? So that makes it the design simple at the same time clear. And all of the equations that we developed earlier, you remember the long equations? They apply to pre-stress concrete also at the ultimate stage. I already really showed you at that time you only put a pre-stressing bias strand in our model. You remember that? Yeah. So we can use use that equation to calculate the strengths of the now we come to secondary moments in pre-stress. Secondary moments we talked about last time a little bit. That means when you post tension because of the curvature of the post tensioning, it is not straight, it induces forces into the member that produces reactions and which are self-balancing, so they become secondary because they are induced as the process of the post-tensioning but they are not primary loading but they just become loading anyway like I showed you last time. So they are secondary does not mean they are small, they could be very large, they could be significant and then we have these parasitic forces also coming in, which are bad, which we want to avoid. That means negative effects of the pre-stressing are also introduced during that process. And we don't want that. For example, you have a cantilever and you put the pre-stressing in such a way that it actually produces the, the reaction downward rather than upward. So it will become a problem for you. So we want to avoid that. So if the Reactions caused by post tensioning forces in continuous slabs or beams are often referred to as secondary or hyperstatic reactions. Right? Hyperstatic, the concept of secondary hyperstatic moments, also referred to as specific moments, has been used for 40 years in design of the. Okay? So, what is this? We, we, we saw it last time that if you put a curve beam and you put the force, it will move the beam up and also you, to bring it down, you will need to put a reaction there, force there, to bring it back and that reaction, this reaction and will, this force that you bring down will induce reactions at the end and that reaction will become, will induce additional bending moments and forces in the system, right? So this is a self-balancing, basically you apply horizontal load right, post tensioning, because of the horizontal load, because of the curvature and everything, the beam goes up, even at the support, in the middle is fine, but it, if there is no support, it will go, it will try to go up, but because there is a support, that means to bring it down to zero deflection, to bring it down to zero deflection for the boundary condition, 
you need a force. You remember in in analysis, um, conjugate beam and so on and so forth, you release all the supports and then you replace them by forces to get the deflections and all. This is the same thing happening in reality. So we bring it down to, to straight position. So you need so this kind of extra secondary forces will be generated. Now this is in addition to the upward forces that you are applying for load balancing. This is coming, that, those are not secondary. Those are primary forces which are applied from the post tensioning. Now it is possible for us to keep this to zero. If the curvatures and everything are perfectly balanced in such a way that the upward forces from the tendon and the downward forces from the curvature will exactly match, this can be zero. We will send a point. No. See, we have upward curvature going up, we have downward curvature. If these two curvatures, because one curvature upward is producing upward forces, the second curvature is producing downward forces. If the tendon profile was done in such a way that they perfectly match each other, there will be no net upward displacement and there will be no secondary forces. Secondary forces are generated because our tendon profile does not match perfectly with the balancing forces that we need to generate. That is why we call them secondary. Right? So secondary can be zero if we can perfectly match the upward and the downward forces in the system. But we can't. It's impossible in practicality. So a net secondary force at this moment called hypostatic secondary will add another force in addition to the upward and downward forces coming from the tendon profile. All right? So please be very clear that the balancing forces from the tendon profile are not the secondary forces. They are the primary loads from the tendons because of the curvature and they are actual loads and they must be applied to the structure as it is. But because of those loads not being self-balancing, which they should be ideally, reactions are created in the structure. And those reactions create further stresses in the structure. So this can be applied further if that is two, two tendons. This is the net line. This is the, so the net displacement will be here. Ideally speaking, this shouldn't happen. But it will happen, right? It can happen. So there is a yeah that is called con that 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 profile is called concordant profile. If the profile is such that the secondary forces are zero, that particular profile is called concordant profile. So that means it is going to produce no secondary effects, and the deviation from the concordant profile is what produces the secondary forces. Clear? And that is, so we can see from here easily that that is the, that is the uh, tendon, this is the net, net effect of that tendon and because of that this additional moment will be added to that moment, right? Okay. In a software, this happens almost automatically. Because the software, when you apply the load, it does an analysis for that load case separately. So that load case moments and everything already includes, automatically includes the effect of the secondary reaction because it's the same loading. So it's not balanced, it's not balanced. So the moment diagrams you get net are inclusive of the secondary moments because it is one analysis, one load case. So you can see from there that secondary moment will, will, will act on top of that, secondary reaction will come and then additional stresses will be generated, additional concrete, set, concrete forces will be needed. So it's just like another moment to be included in the calculation. That means for stress checking, now you need to consider at least three things. At least applied loading, number one, 
could be dead load, live load, applied loading, number one, loading due to upward forces in the tendons, which is called the tendon forces, number two, and the loading from the secondary moments, number three. So stresses must be calculated for three case, three parts of the total system, three loadings. Number one, actual loading, dead load, light load. Number two, the tendon loading. Number three, the secondary loading produced because of the tendon profile. Add them all in every stage of the construction, or every stage stress check should include these three attempts. In reality, you only need two. Applied loading and the tendon forces. Because tendon force analysis order, 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 order already includes the secondary force effects. Right? So you don't need a third level anymore if you're doing it on a computer system. This is this is not so I and mean, this is kind of true, but in a computer system it's not done this way anymore. But this is the right way to do this one. Please read this carefully. Number one, the calculation of the secondary moments or the, or the determination of the line of thrust, which is called line of thrust, net eccentricity, line of thrust, which are equivalent, can be done in several ways. The most common method is in use today is to determine the forces that the cable exerts on the concrete, then to analyze the beam under those loads, loads as I've shown you. Right? What I've just shown you. This can be done in several levels of detail. The structure is analyzed as a beam, the resulting bending moments will be the tail load effect of P to E and the reaction and so on. Using finite element, finite element analysis, actually this is what we do now. Using finite element analysis, the distribution of the cables across the weight and local effects of the cable profile and everything is done. Altern alternatively, the continuous beam virtual work can be used. Nobody uses that anymore. All right? So effectively, now we do this. This one. That means we apply the forces, we do the local effects, we do everything is done completely at the same time. No need to do any simplifications. Right? Losses. This is probably the last topic I will cover today. Losses. Pre stress forces create a lot of losses, and primarily we convert them into two categories immediate losses and long term losses. And people spend a lot and lot and lot of time in trying to calculate these losses. There are huge theories behind that, many methods to do that. And finally, what we know is this. Immediate losses will range between 10 to 20 percent of the initial force, checking force that you apply. So immediate losses means as soon as you release the jack, these losses will reduce your force. So if you pull something and you buy 100 tons, you will actually have 80 tons acting on the member. 20 tons or 15 tons would be lost in these three losses. Anchorage, friction or elastic shortening. Anchorage means when you transfer the force from the jack to the anchor, something is lost. Friction, when you are pulling it, the, the cable is going like this, right, and there is a conduit in which the tendon is lying, when you pull it, there is a friction between that. When you are pulling it, obviously, inside there will be friction at the location where it is touching the tendon because it is not straight. So because of the curvature, sorry? Unbonded, we may because we still need to have some kind of anchor somewhere to keep the main profile. Wherever you change the angle, of the tendon, you will have friction. If the tendon is straight, no friction. But if there is a change in the angle of the tendon, there will be friction, obviously. So you have friction losses. And these, are, these can be very large. And this can be minimized by using tension at the both ends or by reducing the length of the post tensioning. These can be reduced by that. Elastic shortening. What is elastic shortening? Loss. 
This is concrete, correct? No axial stress, zero strain. As soon as you apply pre-stressing force, you release the jack, force comes to concrete. Because of that, there will be axial compression, compression strain, concrete beam will shorten, obviously. That shorten, shortening will reduce the length of the extension that you did. So, you lose some pre-stressing there. That is why we normally use high strength concrete because the shortening will be minimum. Otherwise, you may lose all of the pre-stressing in elastic shortening of the member. Elastic shortening means the strain on the concrete. Oh, strain on the concrete. So that means concrete when you release the jack, the, an the anchor is pushing the concrete together. So it pushes, creates compression strain. Compression strain multiplied by the length becomes the axial shortening and that can be substantial. So axial shortening will lose some part of your pre stressing. So these are immediate losses. Then we have the long term losses which continue for many many years, 10-15 years and they include creep. What is creep? Who can define for me creep very clearly? Increasing the strain at the constant level of stress. Correct. That means increasing strain without changing the stress level. So once you pre-stress, nothing is changing but after some time, in a, in a year, two year, automatically the strain is changing. So that means elastic, elastic shortening continues even after you release the jack. So today the stress was certain, certain. After two years, another 10, 10 millimeter shortening will happen. So 10 millimeter more, short, more loss will happen over 10 years. So pre-stressing capacity will reduce, right? And that is creep. Shrinkage, what is shrinkage? Strain without loading. Creep is strain with constant stress. Shrinkage is shrink strain without loading. There is no load, nothing. The thing is sitting by itself and shrinking, right? Becoming shorter. So shrinkage also becomes, reduces the length of the member and then induces, and obviously pre stressing will be lost. And shrinkage can be short term shrinkage, long term shrinkage. Right? Short term shrinkage is that within when you dry it, when the water evaporates from there, it shrinks, concrete shrinks. Right? Normally, short term shrinkage happens before you apply the pre stressing. Right? But long term shrinkage continues. And relaxation. What is relaxation? Relaxation is creep in steel, but opposite. When you apply, put, pull the, this, the steel here tendon, because of the constant stress, its fibers elongate. It is exactly the same as creep, only reverse direction. It elongates the cable. So the cable becomes more relaxed. It doesn't want to be in tension. It wants to be relaxed. Nobody wants to be in tension, right? So when some, something is tension, it tries to relax, relax itself of the tension over time. And that loss in the, so the, the cable tries to extend by itself, so you, and so the fibers become loose and it does not remain in the same tension as, as before. So relaxation is like the fibers become used to the tension and no longer transmit the same tension anymore. It's reverse of creep. So these three happen over time and they also reduce the effect of the pre stress and this can be as big as 10, 15, 25 percent. So if you add the maximum limit 25 percent, 20 percent, 45 percent of the pre stress, initial pre stress is gone. So your net effect is anywhere between 50 percent to 60 percent. So that means, but the problem is that you have to check all these things. So now the stress that you have to check are not only for the construction stages but also over the life of the structure after one year, five years, ten years. So that after ten years when the stress becomes low, 
the light load should not cause problem. Sometimes reverse post tensioning, load loading, upward deflection of creep, and so on. So these all of these things are important and very very time consuming to do accurately. That is why the codes come to our rescue and they say, okay, if you don't want to do long, you know, maybe calculation, just assume these losses. But the problem is, this is not always conservative. If you assume the loss to be too high, you may be underestimating the effect. For example, I told you about the upward deflection because somebody underestimated or overestimated creep and creep did not happen that much and so on. And also the economy will be reduced. So the contractors will not like that. So people still spend a lot of time in doing more refined analysis of the losses. Right? Especially friction, you can do exactly. These first three losses are easy, relatively easy to calculate. And normally should be done accurately. The next three losses are very difficult to calculate because creep depends on many factors: environment, humidity, uh, exposure, you know, temperature. You don't know about those things over the life of the structure, so it's difficult. Shrinkage is the same problem. Shrinkage is one of the hardest thing to estimate and calculate. Most of the problems in concrete structures are because of shrinkage that you just cannot estimate. Shrinkage is a very, very, very annoying thing in concrete structures. Most, uh, most difficult to capture is shrinkage. Relaxation is easy. Relaxation in steel can be estimated for quite well. All right? So that's the overall view of the losses. Next is the detail of these losses, how they happen. Right? Free tendon, unstressed tendon, unstressed concrete, you put them together, concrete shortens, you have elastic shock. Right? So it explains what I was telling you before. Is that clear? That is the free tendon, free concrete, you pull the, the tendon up to here and then you release it, it wants to go there, concrete doesn't want it to go there, they interact and they find intermediate position. Free tendon wants to be that length, concrete is here, it doesn't want it to go there, so they find an intermediate location, somewhere compromised, where concrete comes a little bit less, steel comes a little bit this way and that is the elastic shortening. Elastic shortening is easy to calculate, you can do that easily, which is a simple, right? Just compressive stress, strain, it's okay. Losses due to friction, a little bit more complicated because of the curvature, as I told you, as when you change the direction of a tendon, because of the change in direction, friction will develop. And this friction will be higher the greater the curvature. So based on the curvature, you can calculate the friction losses. So, because we know the curvature of the tendon, because we know the end location, we know the profile. From profile, you can calculate curvature. From curvature, you, you can back calculate the friction losses using a certain friction coefficient. Okay. So that that is that is the equation that you can use. Average unit tensile stress, and this one checking, and that one, and then this, and then that is the friction coefficient, and other things, and that you get the friction loss. Clear? So that is also mathematically possible to calculate. Friction coefficients for different types of tendons, different types of pipes conduits. All right. So you can see from here, wobble coefficient depends upon the curvature coefficient. For those two coefficients, one together with the different types of tendons and sheeting. And this one, this one, this one, this one, then you can see from here that okay, you get the number, it's a table, it's not so difficult. So the value of K and U can be obtained from the tables. 
normally this should be done accurately. Anchorage loss can be calculated by the anchorage slip over that is easy because we know how much slip is happening. It's the same as elastic shortening. Same, but you just need to know how much, what is the, so it will depend on type of the anchor and type of the jack. And the, the construction companies or manufacturers of these try to reduce this as much as possible. So they keep coming up with special way of doing the anchor and they become known as, you know, Fresne anchor or Divideck anchor or Stronghold anchor. So they are named by the company who developed that anchoring anchorage system. So you buy the whole set and it comes with a certain anchorage loss coefficient. So that's easy, is explained here, that is the anchorage and the loss goes like that, it has an effect like that, so you can see from here. Creep. Some things come in, this is the formula, creep loss, and this is the elastic modulus of steel over concrete and these various stress parameters and modulus elasticity and so on and some factors K, KCR is 2 for pre-tension members and 1.6 for post-tension members, right? So why is that like that? Any idea? Pre-tension is tension before you cast the concrete, right? That one is after, so because of the age difference during that process, the coefficients are a bit different, right? Because of that and the process we follow, so these two are based on that, and these are the FCDS and F stress concrete at CTS of tendons, and FCDS and FCIR, and then we have each one of them. So from that one, you can calculate. This is the the pre-stressing and after applying the load. The difference between the immediate forces and the long-term forces. This is for unborn head. This is for shrinkage. As I told you, shrinkage is quite difficult. There are many you know, complications there, relative humidity and other things. These are many, many factors, time, time, and days, what is the day, and so on. So you need to, to estimate the day, how many days the concrete has been cured or has been used before it is pre-stressed and after that also. Okay, loss due to relaxation, the formula is like that. And then different types of tendons have different K values and J values and from that we can calculate that. Okay, what are the steps for estimation loss of estimation? This is the cycle of the concrete distress member and the losses, each line of loss. Step number one, starting, initial pre-stress loss, jetting stress, as I explained to you, that happens first. Second is transfer stress. Then elastic shortening losses, right, because of the transfer stress. And after that, effective pre-stress for intermediate stage, and after that, creep and shrinkage losses. And after that, effective pre-stress for service level stage, right. So this is the cycle which shows you that what force will be available for different stress checks, right? So stress check and losses can be now integrated through this process. In the beginning, initial jacking, jacking stress should be checked at that point. I showed you the allowable stresses for that, correct? After that, transfer stress. Transfer stress stage should be checked according to the code. No losses at that time except the jacking. Then elastic shortening stresses will be added. Then reduce force will be used to check the effective pre-stress for immediate stage. Dead load, self-load and so on. Then pre-shrinkage and relaxation losses will be added. 
and long term stresses will be checked based on that stress state. So this the stress check and stress loss integrated into one flow. Okay. Steps for estimation losses for post tension. This is for the this was this is for pre-tension members and this is for post-tension members. Post-tension members have more steps, obviously. You have initial pre-stress, checking stress, loss due to friction, initial pre-stress, before transfer, transfer, anchorage loss, then effective pre-stress, then pre-trinkage, then effective. So these losses like that. So for post-tension, you have more steps because of the friction also coming into play. And uh, so these, these you must understand clearly. Right? These last two slides are very important. So please remember them. Timeline of pre-stress loss. Pre-tension, jacking, anchorage, post-tension is friction, anchorage, elastic shortening, initial stage, then the three long-term losses and effective. For pre-tensioning, there is jacking, there is anchor, there is, this is here, there is nothing because it, it is done before that, release, cutting of the strand, elastic shortening happens after that, and then initial, and then there is three losses after that, the two are the same. Before this one, the two are different, pre-tensioning and post-tensioning, once the pre-stress force is transferred, then they are the same, right? For pre-tensioning, these are the types of anchors which are used for temporarily anchoring the wires before cutting them. So we put them, we pull them and anchor them and cut the wires. So they are anchored by friction directly to the to concrete. And these are the temporary supports used to create the profile of the wires. Normally pre-tensioning is not used so much, so I'm not going to concentrate too much on that. This is the post-tensioning structure. And here you have the profile that is lit up. The cable goes through that. There are those are venting tubes for jet for doing the grouting. And so when you grout, you have venting, so it, you make sure that the grout is completely going through. So when it comes out from the venting, then you know the grout is done. So we can inject the grout and then it goes to the side. So we have duct and injection. And these are the anchors. The dead anchors and live anchors. All right. So you can see from here that is the grouting tube on the top. You put the gout there from there, and that is the anchor. This is the dead anchor. This is the live anchor. So those slips are anchored and pushed into this one. It locks it. These are already pre-connected, and this is just this is a dead anchor. And this side is a live anchor. So if you put it, and then you lock it. These are the, the, the wedges that lock the tendons. So some other system on the slab we normally use this kind. That is the slab. That is a dead anchor. This is a live anchor. Dead anchor is just like that, and then the dead end and live end, and then you put the tube of this one. This is the, the, the sheet. The sheet. It's very long, and this is the live anchor after checking. Anchor it and then cut the cable from here. Those are the ducts, plastic ducts and steel ducts. Sometimes they are round, sometimes they are flat. Those are the pre stress strands, they come in cables, and each strand normally has this cross section, normally seven strands one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they wound them around that, and they're very high tension wires. Main problem is when you bring this on the side to open it, it's not easy. As soon as you think they try to open by themselves and they can hurt people at that time. So they have to be unbound very, very carefully through machines so that you don't try to open it by yourself. If you cut these straps, it would just open because it's it's in the very it's in high tension. So if you try to straighten up. So it's very dangerous to handle this this thing. These are the ducts, slab for slab. These are the post tensioning process. So you place the uh, dead, dead, dead anchor, pass through that one, then you insert the jack and then you anchor it. So that's 
accessing and then locking. That is how it really looks like and that is how we show it on the drawing. My dead anchor, live anchor is with the arrow and dead anchor is with the line. So, okay, this is dead, this is live. So, you have to show on the drawings which side is going to be dead, which side is going to be li live because the anchorage, the pre stress losses will depend on that. The friction losses will be zero at the dead anchor and maximum at the live anchor. So, you need to know where you are going. So, pre stressing, this is just showing you the bridges 21%, structural members. 31% hollow core, 13% architectural elements, 35%. So, the cast major is here. And post, post tension steel, buildings with 9%, bridges, so on. As you can see now, that almost all tall buildings, everywhere they are using post tension slabs. That is why the percentage of the use is now growing in buildings. It wasn't the case a few years ago. Last 10, 20, 15 years have seen great use of post tensioning in tall building. This is how it looks like during operations in rear sides, post tension slab, tendons, pre stressing steel, the normal steel, tendons going everywhere, in the profile you can see up and down, up and down, and those are the anchors, those are the blocking tubes. So, this is how a typical site looks like in a, in a building if you go there. This is how the drawing looks like for a post tensioning slab. They use it for everything, domes and so on and so forth. It's a beautiful bridge, long span bridge, bridge also for post tensioning, can clear boxes. So nice. Some other examples, precast, pre-girders, very popular. And they are, these are you know stressed in stages. So they do some stressing in the side, one end, the end table, the rest on the tribe on the other side. So st stages are done and the handling and other things need to be done also. So you can see how these are transported on the side. Some other applications, rear heads or bridges. There are many cases to consider, red load, light load, so on, downward, upward, many cases. And finally, you get the, the profile of the post tensioning and other forces, moment end up from all these cases, consider all of those, and then put the piece pressing in between to do that. This is the kind of heads that I'm talking about. Like this one. So you can see that there are your heads and then post tensioning over them. So post tensioning the, the tendons can be like that. This is a typical big bridge, they are doing the end, the that is a jack, pendants, over there you can see, they are just being threaded and they are now, that, that blue thing is a jack and then now they are doing the end point, jacking and end point. Also for other rear heads, you do all of this, uh, sometimes we pretend it's a small casting place. Okay, so that's it. So basically we are done with post tensioning today.